And then I say uh, hi, everyone, and warm welcome to our topic one webinar with uh, Dave White today on the topic of online participation and digital literacies. Um, yeah, very up to date topic. I think we will get into this. I will not mention uh, the, 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 how many letters are it. Uh, I leave this to you, maybe, Dave, uh, to find a Oh, yeah, time. yeah, we can get into that. Yeah, but um, it's good to see you all here. If you uh, feel free to put on the camera, if not, that's uh, not required. We will do an interactive session today. For those of you who have not um, uh, read or watched um, or don't know who Dave is, Dave is um, the, the head of digital education and academic practice at the University of uh, the Arts, London. And um, yeah, has been with us for quite some time in the course, and we were very happy for this to have you as a regular on the show, but always announce you as a special guest because you're very special to us. And um, yeah, <laughs> it's good to have you with us. And without further ado, I'll leave over, uh, hand over the floor to you, Dave. So uh, take it away. All right, thanks. That's that's brilliant. Thank you for the intro and welcome everyone. Um, I, you know, there's people from from all over, and uh, just to acknowledge. You know, this is this is one of the nice things about doing things online. It's we can come together um, from uh, across different countries without um, everybody getting on an airplane. So that's uh, it's always worth remembering that that's quite a big deal. Um, anyway, yes, my name is Dave White, uh, and what we're going to do is um, sort of explore online participation and digital literacies. I'll just uh, share my screen. No, I'll share my actual PowerPoint. I'm going to do it the super pro way. Oh, that's, is that working? I guess that's working. Yes. Um, so, uh, so this session, we've got an hour. There's some stuff for you to do in it. Um, uh, we've got a mapping process, which is a little kind of sort of drawing mapping process. So if you've got a pen and paper handy, that's useful. It can be done digitally as well. I will signal when it's kind of participation time so that you can, you know, really focus. Um, uh, and I really invite people to chat. I've got the I've got two screens here, which is why I'm going to be doing this business. Um, but I've got the text chat up here and I really encourage people to um, ask questions, make comments, um, tell me I'm wrong about everything uh, as we go. OK, really welcome that. I'll keep an eye on the chat as we go to make it as interactive as possible. So don't be shy. If you've got a thought. Brilliant. Thanks, John. If you've got a thought, then, uh, yeah, uh, drop it into the chat. I feel like it's one of the advantages of this mode of, of, of meeting is that you can is that we can have this sort of conversation going whilst I'm talking as well. I quite like that. Um, OK, so online participation digital literacies um so i want to just sort of frame things with this quote here from kevin kelly who uh, and this is from 1997 and just to sort of highlight that he was right uh, and actually we we we've got quite a long way to uh, connecting everything to everything else and that's one of the reasons that we are talking about ideas of online participation and digital literacies is because of this. You can ask the question, what's fundamentally new about digital that hadn't gone before in some form? And, and, and I'd argue that it's this hyper-connectivity. So, uh, and, and the fact that it's, a, it, it's like a many-to-many -many relationship. So for example, something like Wikipedia wouldn't exist unless we all had the opportunity to publish to Wikipedia, write Wikipedia collectively, and we couldn't do that unless we were all connected to each other. It's a massively powerful thing that I think sometimes we forget because digital has become sort of a normal part of our lives. Um, now, Kevin Kelly did this really interesting thing, which he, and this is from a little while ago, I, I, but I, I really like it because one of the interesting things about the digital space is that whilst we all spend a lot of time in it in various forms, we don't have a shared conception of it. it. Different people imagine different things when you say digital or the web or whatever it might be. So Kevin Kelly really sort of got into this by asking people to draw a map of the internet 
and indicate your home. Very simple. And you get radically different answers. So here's, here's one. These are slightly randomly selected ones, but this is the very kind of wires and computers sort of conception. This is closer to my conception of the digital space. It's kind of a swirly. I mean, obviously, we've got this idea of the cloud as well. This more sort of swirly idea, little red patch down in the bottom left. Um, then this one, I don't know what's going on here, but somebody's answered the question with that image, which is intriguing, isn't it? I think it's something to do with the flow of information. Um, and then this one, uh, whereby this person's idea of the internet is just people. And they seem to be getting on really well because I suspect they drew this before social media went terrible. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, so my point would be same question, completely different answer. And there's, well, uh, don't do that. <laughs> backwards not forwards Dave so this one here is a legitimate answer to that question as is this one here right so for some people it's technology for some people it's people for some uh, people it's information my point is everyone has a different conception and when you work with students or with fellow staff members and you go let's think about the digital, it's worth remembering that then everybody immediately imagines something different, which is why it's kind of good to visualize our sort of imaginary version of the digital. It's good to, to, to make that visible to each other. Then you can have a much more useful discussion about what might be important about it for different people and how different people engage in different ways. So uh, this is a really, useful um and i'd say i i think this remains very true today this this is my favorite educational triangle there are lots of educational triangle bloom's taxonomy probably being the most famous and this is i guess a sort of reversioning of that and what i like about it is the fact that it goes all the way from access and awareness all the way up to identity it, I think it's I think anything that has identity at the top a bit like is it Maslow or Maslow always get that wrong anyway um, is useful what I find in my work is that if you if you apply the idea of identity to a situation then it starts to make sense so you're like why are people acting that way why are they really keen on this thing, but they're really anxious about this thing? It's often to do with, with their personal or professional identity and how it relates to that situation. Now, what's important about this as well is they have put arrows around it. So you, you need to be careful not to fall into this trap that you, you know, you'd learn some access and then some skills and then some practices, and then, I, then your identity is formed and then you've sort of won and it finishes. Actually, we're constantly running up and down or running around these things, right? But it's it's quite a useful way of conceptualizing um, the education process. Everybody's trying to become something. That's certainly my philosophy of education anyway. So I wanted to put that in first before we hit the generative AI scenario. Everybody's talking about generative AI. That sounds like a pop song from the 80s, doesn't it? Um, it's is um, obviously the, the one that people have been talking about a lot recently is chat GPT. It's the, the, the text goes in that order, doesn't it? It's something, it's not easy to pronounce. It's, annoying, it's, an, it's an annoying acronym. Anyway, so um, just to amuse myself, I, I typed, I went to the crayon one that used to be called Dali Mini, I think, and I typed in, um, robot writing an essay and this is one of the ones that chucked back at me I think these are hilarious to me the idea that a robot would sit at a computer and type an essay just seems bizarre to me it's almost as weird as the fact that the Terminator in the Terminator movies has a heads-up display so that information data that he's already generated he puts then in a heads-up display that he then reads and puts back into his head right so it's just bizarre anyway this by the by so I think it's a really interesting area. Um, we're in discussion about it. Everybody's in discussion about it. A uh, couple of things that I'd say. Uh, one is it's 
is what, what's a non-fear-based response to new technology? I think that's really important. So what's a non-defensive, like we need to defend the way education works, okay? That's that's one. Two, this is just my, my, my little points on this. Feel free to come back at me and chat. Um, uh, two is how do you build new technology into larger processes, right? So whenever a new technology comes along, we quite quickly adapt it into a process of some sort, a longer process, you know, with a beginning and an end that is bigger than that individual bit of technology. And I think over time, we're quite good at that. So the question for me is with generative AI, whether it's visual or text or whatever it might be, how do we frame it into a larger process, whether that's writing an essay or the process of education or assessment? I think that's really important. And then third, um, citation, really. There's, there's a big ethical problem with these generative AIs, which is that they float on all of our work, um, but they don't acknowledge it. Uh, and I think the most constructive response I've seen is it the international baccalaureate schools are saying that it's that they're happy for their students to use generative AI as long as they cite it, which I think is a really interesting key. Now, what's the ethics of citing a piece of generative text when the generative text hasn't cited the material that it's used to generate that text and it couldn't even tell you because of the way the technology is constructed? But just to go back, for me, what happens is that new technology tends to push us, tends to push what we mean by learning and the learning process higher up this triangle, if you like. So it makes these bits here in the middle, skills and practice. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor with the way, but it makes the bits in the middle, the skills and practices, it makes it more and more efficient, if you like. Uh, and so we tend to feel like we're skipping to the top of the triangle too quickly. Okay, cheers. Um, so I wrote a little blog, a bit of a weird blog post about this as to how I felt that the generative AI um, was sort of a, a constructive response to it, was it would allow us to spend more time in the top of these triangles and less time in the bottom of these triangles, which is sort of the point of technology. Um, but, you know, I'm just throwing this out there to reflect on and to think I'm just feeding it into an ongoing discussion. I don't think we're a, a kind of right or wrong or official response to this. I'm going to move on because otherwise every discussion about education for the next decade is going to be about generative AI. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you've got any thoughts, then okay. So I've got, I just want, I've just got one bit of framing to do, and then we're going to do this sort of mapping exercise, which is it's quite fun, you know, non, it's, a, it's a sort of informal. I hope you respond to it informally. Digital natives is obviously an idea that's been around for quite a long time. Uh, Mark Prensky um, proposed it around about 2000, and it was the idea that, um, well, no, let's do it this way. If I, if I said digital native to you, what would your response be? What do you, what does that word mean to you, rightly or wrongly or what have you? I mean, what comes into your head? Could you have a little think about that and type your response in the text chat? Just answer that question in, in the text chat. Yeah, well, I think so, John. I think there's something. I think there's. I think there's, it, it's something in that area. Um, uh, I, I see it as the next wave. So, if about ten, fifteen years ago, everybody got upset about Wikipedia because it made getting to information too easy. Now, generating texts is too easy, uh, and. So I'm always suspicious of that being a critique. I, I, I think of it as, sorry, what? Thank you for doing the digital native bit as well. You get, I, I, I'm, I could talk about this all day, as you could tell, so I have, to be dis, I have to be disciplined, but there's something interesting to me that I think of as the convenience threshold. 
which is that students have always been able to, in inverted commas, cheat. And what's happened is this technology just makes that very efficient. So ethically, nothing's changed. It's just got easier. So there's this interesting, and it's a bit like Wikipedia, you know, everybody could go to Encyclopedia de Britannica in the library to get hold of information. Apparently that was fine. But as soon as you could just Google for it, that was a problem. So uh, as educational institutions, I worry that our students re sometimes respond to the way we act by, think by thinking, oh, they, they seem to just not like things being easy. <laughs> They want it all to be horribly hard. So we have to be quite careful with that. Anyway, let me have a look at, thanks for, thanks for responding to the question while I talk about other things. Yeah, so Mona, that's kind of, yeah, exactly that Mona, this is sort of what I'm sort of chatting around. People being comfortable with text, yeah. Generations that have not experienced a time before the internet. Well, that's interesting, yeah. Comfortable with digital someone who grows up with digital technologies. Yeah, yeah, these are all great answers. And it's a big sort of woolly idea anyway. Um, so do keep going with that. I think it's useful to see each other's thoughts. Um, what's Bianca saying? We should be less concerned with how easy something is and rather focus on what we can control and what's producing assessment that trains students ethically in the use of these easy to be. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Um, I mean, my view is we can't control very much. And, um, and I will get off this topic eventually. I find it genuinely funny when universities say, we're gonna ban this technology. And I'm like, you do know all your students have access to the internet and also you can't really detect the use of this technology. I mean, just the concept of banning technology seems like such a bizarre response. And then it, then, then there's also interesting discussion where they're like, well, um, we need to, uh, we, we, we need to think about this quickly because it's becoming popular. I'm like, no, the fact that you've heard about it means it's everywhere already. Like it's happening now. This idea that you can have a chat to get ahead of it, too late. And then lastly, very lastly, is the one that I like the most in terms of it being like an ideological tautology is when academics, perhaps staff are saying, we need to stop our students using this technology. And then they'll turn around and use the same technology in their own practice. Or, you know, you have a senior member of university staff, I couldn't possibly comment, but who, who you know, who will say, well, we really need to um, lock down on students using this generative AI. And then in the next meeting, they're like, maybe we could use AI to more efficiently mark assessments. I'm like, you can't, you, you, you it's like, make your mind up. You can't, anyway, anyway, I'm stopping now. It's fun. It's very, it's a very fun discussion. Thanks for your answer to that. It's really interesting. It's good stuff. Um, I need to plow on. So um, I think what happened historically was the idea of digital natives was became very popular for a while, certainly, because it was essentially a way of expressing a generation gap. So we get to a certain age and we quite like the idea that we don't understand the kids technology. Uh, like I, I genuinely don't understand TikTok and why it should why it's entertaining. So I've got to that age. Right. Um, and the digital natives things was was a sort of a way of putting a label on the generation generational generation gap process because we quite like a generation gap again coming back to identity you know we get to a certain age and w there's a habit of identifying ourselves because we can't do the things or we don't value the things that the kids are doing right um and so it became a bit of a negative thing and it, the problem with it was that it it encouraged us as educational institutions to imagine that the young people that were entering our institutions kind of understood everything about the digital environment, even if we didn't. And that was totally not true. And it's still not true. Everybody has to learn everything, right? They may be more or less culturally comfortable with these shifts because they didn't they they haven't got they haven't developed practices that are being disrupted by the technology they're developing practices as the technology they're like i said about process 
because they're developing their own practices and ways of being in the world, they can incorporate that technology in. Whereas if you're older, it perhaps becomes slightly more confrontational. But the point is, digital natives somewhat undercut. It, it gave us a reason to not teach students how to engage with the digital environment, basically. And it just wasn't really right. So I had an argument with Mark Prensky. I won't go into that, but I had an argument with him and it didn't go very well. Um, so what we'll, do, what we'll do is we'll go on to the mapping workshop. So what I proposed a while back is this idea of visitors and residents. And the strength of the idea, I think, is that it's not about, it's a, not a generational idea, okay? So it's not saying young people think this and older people think this, which very quickly doesn't make any sense, given that, given that I'm, a, I, I, I guess, a, a digital native as defined by Prensky is somebody so probably in your late 40s now, if you see what I mean. So, it, you know, things turn over. I suggested this idea of visitor and residence, which isn't generational, it's based on motivation to engage. So it doesn't matter who you are, this idea is applicable to a greater or lesser extent. What I'm going to do now is just very quickly take you through the idea and then the mapping process we're going to do. And then I'm going to ask you to do that mapping process, which will only take a few minutes. And then we can have a chat about some of the maps that you generate. So I'll just explain this continuum here. So it is a continuum. It's like a spectrum or a continuum. And um, yeah, I recognize that many of you might not be operating. English might not be your, might be an additional language for you. And I talk quite quickly. <laughs> and these are, these, are, these are quite metaphorical, abstract ideas. I'm going to slow down a little bit. Um, so it's a continuum, it's not two boxes, okay? It's like a sliding scale. Uh, and at one end is like pure visitor mode and the other end is pure resident mode. So I'm just gonna describe either end of the continuum because it's the easiest way to do it. So in visitor mode, the easiest way to think about it is that you're imagining you're conceptualizing, you're thinking about the web as a series of tools, okay? So you're trying to get a specific thing done. You decide what you want to do, you find the right tool, you get that thing done, and then you step away. Significantly, you don't leave a social trace. You're going to leave a data trace, but you don't leave a social trace on the surface of the internet, if you like. So if I do online banking, that's a very visitor mode thing to do because it's just me, nobody else is seeing what's going on, for example. At the other end of the continuum, you're sort of seeing the web as a series of spaces or places. And if we think about the Kevin Kelly drawings and the guy with all the smiley faces, as soon as we got hyper-connected and then, and then brought in social media, uh, anywhere where there's more than one person becomes a place, okay? It's, it, it's, it can be a tool as well, but it becomes a place. So we made the digital environment into a set of places. It's like this Zoom meeting now is a place of sorts because there are multiple people experiencing it, you know, basically at the same time. What kind of place it is, is interesting to consider, but it is a place. So when you go online in like a resident mode, your main motivation is to engage with other people in some form. So you can imagine there are lots of different ways of doing that. Uh, again, this session is, you know, somewhat resident in, the, in, in those senses. But it doesn't have to be just based on social media and webcam -y type media. You know, some people are really, really resident in email because that's the place where they connect with people as a person, if you like. Uh, so it's about that mode, right? The technology doesn't completely mandate the mode. It's the way that you choose to use it. Different people use different technologies in different ways, right? So, you know, at the resident end, the very extreme resident end, you're probably doing things that are really, really visible like things that can anybody can see online, things that people can 
you know, like um, tw Twitter used to be like that. You could get, when you Googled, you could Google straight into Twitter and you, you can read tweets without being a member of Twitter. So, for example, in the middle, there's a, this massive chunk of stuff, which I'd say what, what we're doing at the moment, where it is sort of resident, but there's like an edge to it. So it's within a known group. You could probably think about lots of things. Lots of work is like that now. Um, clubs, societies, um, a lot of teaching falls into that, where we're, we're encouraging students to be, operate in quite a resident way, but within a particular group or cohort. So that's useful to think about. And then the, the lastly is context. So, and I think this this was important to me, you know, as we we're developing this idea that that um, your your social or or professional context. Uh, has a massive you know influence on the the way that you're engaging uh, and again comes back to identity you know I, I'm Dave White the individual I'm also head of education and academic practice that's a weird mixed up thing <laughs> but you know it's still nevertheless you know you're playing with different identities in terms of how you might engage so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you uh uh, to a couple of versions of my maps and then I'm going to ask you to do it for yourself so this map I realized because like I got super old that I've been showing people this map and it's probably 10 years old right so every time I put this map up on screen I'm like I need to update this well big news I updated my map this morning and I'm going to show you my new map so this is an old one and it's intriguing how much it's changed. It, it, you know, it changes over time. It's not fixed. So this is the new one. Slightly more colors. Um, and I'll just run you through the sort of rationale that the reason why I put things in certain places very quickly. So uh, this is this is a messy process. It's not precise. It's best to just sort of go with your instinct. And, and then have a look at it and have a think about it. The point of the map is it helps us to reflect and discuss. It's not to kind of make a kind of perfect representation. No, no, I don't use chat GPT. <laughs> I just watch other people using it. I'm, I'm, I don't want to get sucked into it. It looks like too much fun. And I know the second I start using it, I'll stop thinking about it and just go, look at all this cool stuff, because I'm terrible with that. Anyway, so... <laughs> WhatsApp, that's a biggie, and it annoys me, if I'm honest, because this is a horrible mix of work and personal stuff in there. And every time a little WhatsApp message notification goes off, I get quite stressed because it's like, is it one of my children having a disaster at university? Or is it my boss going, hey, I need this thing for a presentation tomorrow? It's never good. Well, sometimes it's good, but it's become like too, too big. Like I'm really resident and I wish I wasn't, right? And it's just a nasty mix of things. Microsoft Teams, that's a real COVID thing. You know, that wouldn't have been there before COVID. I'm really resonant. I like it. You know, I like working this way. People will blip me Microsoft Teams messages all day long and I'll get straight back to them because it's a good excuse for me to stop whatever actual bit of work I'm supposed to be doing. But, you know, so that's why that's very institutional and very resonant. It's not that personal. Twitter, which used to be where I was most resident, since the Musk stuff and just since social media has become harder and harder to express opinions in and have actual, you know, dialogue in without it becoming controversial. Uh, and I guess maybe as my roles become more senior at the university, so, you know, I have to be quite careful about what I say. Twitter has become less residential for me over the years, sadly. It's a bit sad about that. I blog infrequently. It's it's very much about work. Uh, I do respond to comments, but again, most of that's moved into people respond to that. They're more likely to tweet me about a blog post than to write a blog comment. Okay, although I can see blogs coming back as social media gets more and more complicated. OneDrive work. Uh, shared documents the reason that's slightly resident is because sometimes you're in there working on the same thing at the same time for example I think that's a really interesting moment I think when you're in it if you're in like a word document on your own it's definitely a tool as soon as you see somebody else drop in and start editing it becomes a place 
so you know and you st and you res you suddenly think about what you're doing in a different way or at least i do facebook i'm a member of uh, like a sports club and so i got back into facebook because that's where they operate i don't like it but my friends are there so i'm there right uh, and then personal email which i'm not very chatty and it's quite administrative so that's just my map You'll have different things. This is not correct. This is not a correct map or an incorrect map. It's just mine. There's all sorts of things missing from it, but it just helps me to think through my engagement. Uh, and when I realized, <laughs> well, you know, that may be John, maybe that's across the whole of your map. I'm quite happy for people to have maps as just one massive square. And it just says World Warcraft. That's my whole life. Just don't show it to your employer. Um, I think when I did my map, it made me realize why I was so annoyed with WhatsApp, because I just had to draw that box bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And I thought, oh, I could see the problem here. So sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. So I hope that's sort of useful. Um, what we're going to do now, and I'll put my map back up on screen, is I'm going to ask you to grab a pen, a piece of paper, pencils, colored pens, whatever your preferred thing is. If you prefer doing it digitally, go for it. There's a Padlet, which is on the end of that URL, or you can QR code your way there. I'm hoping that I updated that. I think I did. I know I did. Uh, when you've drawn a kind of first version of your map, go to the Padlet and chuck it in to the Padlet. The easiest way to do that is just to use your mobile phone, which is why we've got the QR code. So, you know, if you scroll on a bit of paper in front of you, you can you can literally then get your mobile phone, go to the Padlet, take a photo and sort of drop it in there. And then what we'll do is we'll have a little look at them and a little chat. As I say, just go with your instinct. We're only going to spend about seven minutes doing maps uh, and chucking them up there. OK, um, you never get your map right first time. As I say, the, the important thing about the maps is that they generate discussion and reflection. The map itself is less important than the discussion and, and the conversation. Okay, uh, let us know in chat. Oh, thanks, you, the the, uh, the links in, in, in the chat as well, if you just wanna um, click. Let me know in chat if none of this makes any sense or if you get stuck, but otherwise I'm gonna attempt to stay quiet for a couple of minutes so that you can get on with that process. Um, in a minute or two, once everybody's got to Padlet, I'll I'll flip it back to my map so that you've got like a reference. But if everybody's map looks like mine, I know you're cheating. <laughs> <laughs> you asked Delhi to uh, do a map like this? Uh, you know what? There might be enough visitor and residence maps out there on the web that uh, you could you could get it to do that. True. I mean, we had this discussion at work because we're a little we're a little bit smug at UAL because we're art and design and fashion and all the rest of it. We're like, yeah, this AI stuff won't hurt us because we like we're all about personal practice and reflection. But I'm like, it's not true though, is it? We put enough. 500 word student reflections into turn it in and then an AI scrapes that then you you could write write me a reflective piece on this creative brief it you know do you know what I mean yeah yeah it, it's just a question of it getting a big enough corpus of text in any given area so I guess my thinking is on the assumption that it that it will very quickly become good at almost all forms of assessment. There's mm. a sort of fundamental logic to that because any any activity that generates a large corpus of text, it will be able to respond to, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go to the Padlet myself as well. And just yes, just... no, check. I saw some some. something indicating that people found to it. Okay, cool. But I think everyone's busy drawing maps, finding yeah. 
paper maybe in there. That's it. It's like a fun, it's a fun kind of craft based process. Yeah. Oh, I typoed the URL. <laughs> I don't know why I'm typing it in. It's just thing to the okay. Yeah. Okay. Somebody put a comment in about a digital diet, which is an interesting idea. And I know what they mean. I think I think we're also in the most extreme part of the post COVID, not post COVID, but post lockdown sort of snap back from digital as well. True. I, th I could say I think it's going to even out from here, but you know we were all online a lot of the time. Yeah. Yeah, it cool. feels like yeah that people. In general, like our webinars are maybe a little bit less attended. Yeah. Maybe. Oh, thanks, John, for that link. That's yeah. exactly what I was talking about. Like the whole point of generative AI is that it gets better at things. But it actually, interestingly, I think people are still responding to it as if it's like a fixed space. Um, I did read a very long article about how chat GPT actually works, which I understood about 80% of. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? School told me I should have been a scientist, but uh, I'm not disciplined enough to think in a straight line enough to do the maths. <laughs> anyway, oh, uh, there's a map in there, lovely. Nice. So what I'm going to do is just, um, yeah, thanks for that comment as well. Yeah. I'm just going to wait for a few more maps to come in. I don't want anybody to sort of, and then, then we'll talk through them, but there's an opportunity to, you know, while we're chatting through them, you can carry on sketching yours. Um, and you can carry on sketching it after the session. Even, even if you don't get finished until towards the end of the session or after the session, then it's worth posting it into the Padlet because it's a nice shared resource for ONL. And I think it's nice to see how different people's maps are. There's another one, colors. There's a few more appearing. Yeah, grid map, that's fine. to remember what I'm just... just I'll just wait for a couple more and then we'll, we'll start we'll start chatting this is a relatively straightforward process you can do it with any group of people you know with that students or colleagues is some more appearing lovely okay so uh do carry on and you know i'll be in i'll sort of be in the background what i'm going to do i'm going to share the padlet okay Think, is that, am I sharing the Padlet now? No, you're sharing the slide. Okay. Uh, I think what's happened is Zoom's got. Oh, I haven't. I didn't hit the share button. Is that is that better? No. Now you can see the Padlet, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm going to start. I, we'll just do this for a few minutes again. Um, I, as you can imagine, you could spend you can spend a kind of whole afternoon doing this. I think. Um, this one looks fun. Uh, 
whose is this? And if you're if you're happy to um, jump on the mic and kind of tell us about it, then I, you know, now's your chance. Uh, that would be mine. Uh... <laughs> Hi. Hi. So, do you want to tell us a bit? It, I tell you, I tell you what jumps out at me is you've remembered to put Netflix on. I think a lot of people have forgotten that that's part of the internet. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's a digital form of watching movies. So what yeah. I did actually forget to put on that I've actually subsequently put on is a big block that covers almost all of it again yeah. with YouTube over it because I use YouTube for work and play and I'm pretty much always almost there. So And, and, and do you work with somebody called Charlotta? Because she seemed pretty confident that it was your map. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so there you are my pbl group <laughs> so 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 you've been you it's it's interesting that your kind of uh map of engagement is quite it's like it's a, it's a sort of a fingerprint of sorts isn't it is there anything about the what i mean is there anything when you were doing the map what kind of came up in your mind about how you're engaging online what were the kind of pros what do you see as the pros and cons of how you engage online oh um i'm well i would actually if we could have used the term digital native uh, i love being online actually right. uh 90 of my time that i'm awake i'm actually spending online in some way shape or form um just dealing or interacting with content, interacting with people, uh, playing games, if even if that. So yeah, yeah, across the spectrum. Yeah. And, and so, and hence why the map's so full, and there's a bit of Discord and Steam hiding in there as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Brilliant. No. Okay. Thanks for that. That's. Um, I hope you found the process useful. I'm gonna. I'm gonna um, have a look at the different. Right. Well, this one because it it appeared first. So whoever this is works quickly. Again, if you want to jump on the mic, then jump on the mic and and uh, to talk it through. If not, that's fine. Yeah. The yeah. Actually, this is mine, and I think uh, I. It's very similar to yours, but I think I included YouTube because I use it for yeah. uh, my work as well for like entertainment purpose. But what I also forgot is to include uh, Wikipedia, uh, which is also yeah. Yeah. kind of a uh, good knowledge repository. But, yeah, I, yeah. Think, I think quite often with maps, um, a lot of the visitor, a lot of the visitor activity we almost forget to put on because it's, we just use it just like that. And yes, we're so exactly. used to using it, we don't even think about it. You put Google on, which I'm guessing you mean like Google search. So that's like yeah. Google search and everything you find through Google search. Is this yeah, yeah, yeah. Map. Some kind of articles and yeah. those which are yeah. uh, kind of uh, can be searched from the search engines. Like and, we, and I think we underestimate that because it. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, of course. I, I'm in these ongoing discussions about the difference between um, residential face to face courses and, and, and online courses. And, you know, actually, all of our students spend most of their time studying by looking at a screen, right? Yeah, of course. Like nowadays, it's, it, it, it is one of the most productive way. Yeah, 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 a absolutely. Um, it, it, to the extent that I think students that would be coming into my university now. Well, it's a fun, so this is an indulgence, but it's a fun, it's a fun thing to explain a physical library card catalog to somebody who's like 20, because when you start explaining it, you, you get into it a little bit and then go, wait a minute, this is insane. How did this ever work? <laughs> so, so anyway, so you go to a little drawer and there's a bit of paper that tells you where there's some more paper. Anyway, um, no, it's, 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 it's interesting and it, it's interesting you did that so quickly and uh, to me that map like i i like to imagine that i i understand how you're operating online because of that map but, all right i'm gonna i'm gonna thank you i'm gonna go to a different one uh Some digital ones yeah i'm gonna that one let's have a go at this one Who, who's that and are you prepared to to wow outlook 
you you like email who um oh, that's uh, mine hello hi do you want to, do you want to talk us through i as obviously I, I i jumped on the outlook thing is that do you spend a lot of your time emailing yeah for work students yeah colleagues so are you in the kind of job where you have to, where you're um, sort of managing people via email and telling them information that they need to know a lot of the time? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That that make, that that makes a lot of sense. And how do you how do you feel about your map having made it? How do you how do you is, are there any bits of it that you like? Any bits of it that you're like, mm, I'm not so happy with the way that this works in my life or I don't know. I've not thought about it enough yet. I think I'm missing uh, missing a lot of things. Yeah. I probably need to think about this a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. And you got LinkedIn, which is a big one, which I which I always forget to map because I don't like yeah. LinkedIn. Just personally, I don't like LinkedIn. You see, so I. But but it it seems you've got quite. Have you got quite a good LinkedIn profile? Uh, no, I'm lurking a lot, mostly on LinkedIn. Just consuming yeah. rather than doing anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've, that's an interesting phrase. I think you said lurking. Is that right? Mm. So yeah, a few years ago, I came up with this idea of elegant lurking because um, I, I think it's I think the like most of us spend ninety percent of our time in social media, not typing but reading. Just, do you see what I mean? It, it. it any good platform allows you to to engage with it without being super visible. So I think um, lurking is the right phrase. I'm just highlighting that it's got this odd. It sounds creepy, <laughs> and we should do with a better word, right? Um, no, that's interesting. And you and you're the first. But you've got quite a big. You're quite active on Instagram. Do you post to Instagram a bit? Uh, yes, I do, but to a close channel there you go okay yeah yeah, yeah. Close and, I, and I think that's really important I think we've got better at this more recently but you know we need to remember that most of the internet is people doing things with known groups like this the, whereas certainly when so do you remember when Facebook arrived maybe you do maybe you don't and there was a lot of talk about people going I can't believe you've got all these Facebook friends instead mm -hmm. of real friends and you know, I think we've got past that now, but it's it's quite unusual for people to be just a hundred percent visible socially. Most people have got that more locked down now. Whereas I think when social media first arrived, people weren't thinking in those terms. And, and I feel like actually a bit of a generational thing um, is that uh, people of my my kids' age uh kind of late teenagers early 20s that that i think they're much more sensitive to notions of privacy than certainly oh, i yeah. was oh yes yeah. yes definitely my students are like that in okay. fact my students tell me that facebook is for old people well it kind of is <laughs> <laughs> although I, I saw a first tweet i saw a great tweet i think it was this morning that they said their nine-year-old had told them that TikTok was just for old people and it was really cringy. Oh, wow. So it just, like, the, the churn is so fast. Um, I, I, I can remember talking to a 19-year-old student who said, well, the problem with the young people is they're on social media too much. And they were talking about 16-year-olds. <laughs> so it's like the concept of a generation, because, because generations are sometimes now defined by the platform that was emergent when their identities were forming is the concept of a generation is getting narrower and narrower my eldest kid has this theory that there's a very particular generation which were kids like him that had mobile phones but they weren't smartphones so they ran their social life by text so this is a very particular generation of people that lasted about three years so anyway thank you for sharing your map um that's that's and uh that, that's that's an interesting one well they're all interesting in different ways um what i'm going to do is, is is move on i hope you don't either feel too relieved or too disappointed that i didn't show your map um they're really great thing to because i know that you've got reflective blogs they're a great thing to like write a little commentary a little reflection about and post to a blog um 
because it's just really because if you if you say to someone tell me about your digital footprint or tell me about your digital literacies it's just like too big a question but if you draw your map it gives you a, a good chance of being able to go oh this bit's a bit like this and that bit's a bit like that okay so it's like a way in um special mention for the white on black map there i like that um okay brilliant thanks for engaging with that Obviously, that Padlet is just there now for you to have a look. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share my slides again, and I'm going to try and get it right. I feel like it's this button. How's that feel? Yeah? Great. OK. Just for the last sort of nine minutes or so, I'm just going to whiz through some ideas. I will go slightly too fast. Uh, so we did that. We've had a discussion. So that's good. We did that bit. Um, for me, there's something interesting going on between the difference between hierarchical ways of working and network ways of working. So educational, I just wanted to get this out there because I think it's a, a useful way of understanding what's happening perhaps in your institutions or in your workplace. Institutions tend to operate largely hierarchically, structurally. The internet is entirely networky, 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 although it's got its own structures in it. What, what I find is wherever there's an it, something interesting is happening or something controversial is happening, it's often where hierarchical ideas of the world and the way things should be done are in tension with networked ways of operating. So chat GPT, really good example, is you know, a, a, an old fashioned response to that is where you should learn how to become an academic properly and write essays. And, you know, the, there's, a, there's a proper way of doing it. There's a certain structure and you move through a high up through a hierarchy in a very, very because it's about power, isn't it? It's about power and and who's who's allowed through which gate at what point. Something like chat GPT comes along completely gorgeously ignorant of those hierarchies and just smashes a massive hole in the side of a hierarchy. For me, it's not about one being better than another. You need the hierarchy. You can't do like assessment without hierarchy. You've got to have rules and rule bricks, rubrics and all kinds. It's, for me, it's about how do you take advantage of the best of both worlds, right? And in theory terms, if you really want to get into it, you could argue that in terms of theories of learning, this the hierarchies are like constructivism. And uh, I think a really interesting kind of theory of learning is connectivism and how these interplay is, is really fascinating, really fascinating. And just the way that our culture responds to these things. And here's a quote from uh, ONL from a couple of runs before, but I thought it was useful to hang on to because the way that ONL is structured is very connectivist, very networked, and you get this concept that Dave Cormier put forward, which is you as a community are the curriculum, which I think is a really interesting idea. Now, it does rely on it on, on the people in the community having a kind of access to literacies at a level that allows them to operate in a networked way so it's an interesting construction um maps very quickly i'm not going to go into this in a big way the first time i ever ran a mapping workshop and when i looked at them i realized that facebook was in lots of different places on different people's maps it was just what i was saying earlier which is the platform and the technology doesn't mandate how we use it if you like you can use facebook like a, an address book or you can be all over it posting super visibly super networked all the time right so you can't asking someone which platforms they use doesn't tell you about their modes of engagement generally some people have very empty maps that's fine everybody can account for why i suspect this was a very good student some people have busier maps and multiple as you probably know, like multiple identities in the same platforms because they've got a different login for different roles in their life. Some people have this big lump in the middle because they haven't figured out who they are yet. I think that's a very young person. Just going to whiz through these. This person decided to use red for their their a club or a society that they they had that role as the head of a club or society, and the black was their work. Um, the, so if we go on to so what, I think 
beyond what we've just done, people use the visitor. It's not all about the visitor and residence idea. I'm just sort of using it as a vehicle to talk about other things. But it's interesting to me that more recently, people have really used it as a research method, if you like, rather than just a reflective method. So it's been really nice for me to see that. I did that um, a couple of years ago, got 350 or 380 people to do maps and then and then just tracked which ones were totally filled in and which ones were less filled in anyway the point was if you look at this age block so these represent different age groups the people who had the most filled in maps completely even spread of age groups i.e it, old it's not that old old people are just as resident as anybody else it just depends who you are and what you're trying to do i guess is the point of that um and you can add different, you can add your own sort of ways of annotating arrows, the way that things flow into each other. Um, this person got arrows and notes. Uh, this person's got a, a, a nice uh, sort of ideal self, a kind of aspirational map. So this was a, a space that they really wanted to be in. They wanted to be kind of like a digital scholar. So I think that's, it, you know, it's a developmental tool as well, potentially. So sorry for rushing through that. Obviously, I can share the slides, um, but I think, you know, I can see that you, everybody's got into that process. As I say, the map is just there as a vehicle, as a, as a way of getting at other ideas. So I hope that you can sort of take them into the rest of ONL as a kind of platform to think about stuff, you know, other issues, other aspects of, of online education. Uh, so this is like my bookend quote. So you remember the one at the start of Kevin Kelly said, you know, there's the, there's a drive to connect everything to everything else. But this is this is one of my favorite quotes ever. And it's from George Siemens, who, you know, I've, I've met uh, and uh, uh, it was. Yeah, he, he's 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 a he's just a very strong thinker in this area. But. This is the kind of educational response to the fact that Kevin Kelly was right, which is, and I think it's very positive, is that now that knowledge and networks are abundant, which I think we have to agree is the case, the emphasis should be on connections. So this is where connectivism comes from. So what we can say is, if we think of ourselves as educators, then we are the arbiter of connections rather than the gatekeepers of knowledge. Now, I, it seems unlikely to me that anybody would choose to do the ONL course if you felt like you're a gatekeeper of knowledge. I think we're a somewhat self-selecting group, but nevertheless, I'll, 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 I'll just sort of touch on it again. If you, if you look at the reactions to chat GPT, then you can see the institutions that see themselves as, as gatekeepers of knowledge or culture. And you can see the institutions that see themselves as the arbiters of connections. Now, I know which side history's on. <laughs> I, I, I know which way is more fundamentally educational. I'd argue that in the UK, the, the, the fancy universities that are of high cultural standing that say, we're gonna ban these technologies, it's because they're trying to police culture rather than inform education. A little bit of politics at the end there. Uh, and that's it. Thank you for hanging on in there. Uh, I hope you found it useful. I'll hand back to you. Yeah, thank you so much, thank Dave. You. And uh, yeah, I don't know if we have... Hello? Hello. No, I I heard someone else talking and I was not sure if this was meant as a thank you as a comment or question. Um, please join us then everyone else also next week for a tweet chat, right? We uh, might have to do an update about the time. We get back to you as soon as possible. Yeah, that's my fault. Um, but uh, yeah, I hope you'll be able to join us. I will put on the recording uh, now and... Um, yeah, thank you so much, Dave, for this hour. Yeah, cheers, everyone. Thanks for joining in. It doesn't work unless people join in. And then that's education. Yeah. All right, cheers.